everybody, welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual accelerator in the world. We are headquartered in Silicon Valley, and our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in annual revenue and beyond, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs. Now, in support of that mission, we've been doing these roundtables. It's only part of the programming. And we have done 273 of these sessions so far. This is the 274th session. And uh, we have accumulated a lot of experience in uh, coaching entrepreneurs at these sessions. We've had over 30,000 people participate. So it's a you know, tried and true working session, so to speak, where we work with entrepreneurs. The event is being recorded. You will have the recording available on our YouTube channel. If you're following, if you're live tweeting the show, actually use the hashtag 1M1M. If you want to follow us, our Twitter uh, handles are 1M by 1M and at Romana. Some of you probably are here because of Twitter. 1M1M Roundtables is the YouTube channel where you'll find, where you'll find the recording of this session as well as all previous sessions. That's our YouTube channel. These are the call-in instructions. We're not ready for call-in yet, but Please remember this is a round table. So we want you to participate. We want you to ask questions, engage, comment, issues, whatever you want to discuss. Um, I will put the slide back up when we are ready for call-in discussions. Um, we are going to start, however, with Tim Henschel, CEO of Hotel Planner, a very cool company that I, I met Tim just a few months ago and was fascinated by the story of his entrepreneur journey and invited him to come and speak with our uh, entrepreneurs here and share some of that journey with us. Congratulations, Tim, on what you've achieved so far, and welcome to the show. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Um, calling in, actually, from a hotel in Kent, uh, we have one of our big events going on right now for the PGA Tour that we title sponsor. Uh, it's the last uh, tournament of the season before we have the championships in Spain. So, uh, hence my dress and uh, and the background. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this. Is the tour. There we go, PGA Europe Tour, fantastic. So that's actually a good uh, segue, Tim, into uh, introducing our uh, audience to to Hotel Planner. What are you doing with Hotel Planner, and um, you know why are you in the PGA Tour? Well, we're we're into sports because uh, sports. Travel makes up about 30% of the uh, 3,000 groups we do a day worldwide. We started out 13 years ago as just a little startup in California, much like a lot of tech companies. Um, my background was from Cornell Hotel School with a uh, concentration in computer science, and, uh, and my major was hotel management. My family's been in the industry for multiple generations as hotel owners. And, uh, you know, it's always been a passion of mine to get into the business. And since the business now mainly for bookings is, is uh, digital, uh, we specialized in group travel online. And so that's how Hotel Planner was born 13 years ago with me and uh, co-founder John Prince, who came from IBM as a senior software engineer. And uh, he heads up our technology division as our CEO. He's based out of our head. Palm Beach. I'm based out of uh, uh, London, and together we are uh, growing the company up to 120 employees, um, and over uh, 25 million now in, in turnover, and uh, as our revenue and, and uh, contracting over uh, half a billion in, in hotel group uh, contracts a year. So yeah, that's basically a little intro. Great. So, Tim, uh, I remember actually um, even maybe 10 years, 12 years back, there were a whole bunch of group book booking, group hotel booking, group travel planning websites and startups that have got lots of funding and so forth. Now, what happened? It sounds like those have imploded and you have emerged as a uh, winner in the category. Tell us about what happened in the competitive landscape in the market. 
Yeah, the, land, the landscape is always changing online. Um, there's still startups that are, that are coming in this online group space, and I'm sure there always will be other people uh, uh, looking at this space. It's an exciting space. You know, we're a fast-growing company, so people see that, and, and it definitely makes them interested in, in getting involved in the space. Uh, when we first started in 2003, there were a couple of uh, uh, large, well-funded startups that uh, were burning through around $20 million a year. And uh, we kind of all had the OTA market uh, uh, divvied up in terms of, of different partnerships. At the time, uh, we were exclusive with Priceline to do their group travel. And then uh, two competitors had uh, Orbitz and, and Travelocity. But we'd always been, uh, or, you know, we had some angel funding, but, but you know, we grew organically uh, after being profitable by year three. So we uh, didn't have a, a, a big burn. We were, you know, uh, just spending what we made. And so when uh, the market crashed and, uh, and the debt um, crisis, that it was 2008, uh, those guys, uh, you know, unfortunately had to go under. Uh, well, fortunately for us, unfortunately for them. And then we uh, we picked up their partnerships with those OTA partners, and and now we uh, we power every major OTA for for group hotel bookings of ten rooms plus online. So uh, yeah, it's been some some aggressive growth in the last five years from that. So take us a little bit back to the very beginning. You said you became profitable in three years with a little bit of angel funding. Give us a bit more color on that journey in the first phase. How did you become profitable so quickly? What was what were some of the secrets and strategies of of achieving that milestone quickly? Well, for me, it was aggressive weight gain. Um, you know, I had always been an athlete in, in high school and college, and then once I got out of school and started this company, I didn't exercise at all. So I went from, from an ideal weight of around 170 to 180 all the way up to 250 pounds. And that basically just had everything to do with 16-hour work days. So, you know, I'd say that a lot of the bootstrapping came from, from you know, getting our hands dirty and just, just you know, uh, being, being – uh, very, 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 uh, how do you say it? Uh, Discipline. Discipline workers, I guess. Uh, yeah, you know, 16 hour a day, seven days a week, that sort of thing. So, so we. You uh, know, what I observe also, Tim, is that um, you were not going mindlessly after eyeballs. You were going after, you had a real business model. You were actually booking hotels and collecting commissions right from the beginning, right? So you had revenues right from the beginning. Yeah, so it's not – It's well, you know, our market is niche, so only 2% of every individual search is a group search online. So, you know, if 100 people search Expedia for uh, individual hotel rooms, 2% of those will, you know, be looking for a group. So, yeah. you know, luckily those groups are going to be around – 20 to 30 times bigger in terms of the demand for rooms than, than individuals. So it's, uh, it makes for bigger revenue on each transaction, but finding that transaction is a little tougher. So we always had to – we couldn't go mass market all the time. That's why you know, we have to look and uh, get participate in things and sponsor things where there are groups like, you know, the PGA where you have uh, a lot of – Corporate groups that attend uh, PGA events. You guys got um, uh, guys weekend golf groups, and then there's there's uh, women's spa groups based around golf resorts. So you know there's group business based around that sector, and then of course team sports in general. Um, you know we have NFL teams that uh, we've been sponsors and doing their team travel for years and years and years, like St. Louis Rams, Washington Redskins, San Diego Chargers. Uh, NBA teams like LA Clippers, uh, NHL, uh, Florida Panthers, over here, pro f football teams in the UK like uh, Millwall, uh, AFC uh, Wimbledon, um, QPR, Queen yeah. Park Rangers, a little bit. So, you know, we'll do that and then we'll partner with, you know, big companies that are big in the wedding business. So, 
we're going to get that business as well. So it's just about finding your customer out there more than just going mass market. So you went uh, specifically segment-wise and, and did some direct marketing into the sports group travel segments to get those, to find those transactions, yes? Right, right. So, you know, every group market segment we look at is a uh, specific market to us, and so that's how we've kind of made the big, a very big world a lot smaller so we can target, uh, you know, our exact customer. And, of course, that's... Well, and also what uh, strikes me is that you turned what um, perhaps your competitors were looking at as a B2C business into almost a B2B business, which is much easier to, well, B2B businesses, you can deal with sales as opposed to pure marketing, and, and that makes things a lot more deterministic if you have a value proposition that resonates. Yeah, no, definitely. We, we always looked at it as we wanted to um, not reinvent the, the group booking market per se, but, but make it more efficient through our use of technology. So when other competitors were trying to get people to just slap down a credit card and, and do it 100% on their own with, without any help from, from anybody. We were looking at the process and saying, you know, how do we, you know, use digital payment to make the process easier but not take away the human interaction, which was essential to make sure that, that groups would get booked efficiently and, and at the best rate. So. What we did was we regionalized and we took, uh, you know, people that were on property at prestigious group booking hotels, big conference hotels, and we recruited them to work for us and stay in market. And then anybody that's going to book a group into that, that city, we assigned them to that person. So they've got 10 plus years of experience working on group contracts from, from prestigious hotels in that area. They know the, the city and then they can, uh, be a, a very good resource for the, the first-time group planners or experienced group planners that, that we're putting them in touch with to find the right property for them, the, the perfect property, you know, uh, because that person is in market and has an idea, yeah. uh, knowledge of, of that property. Like a personal concierge. Exactly, and then also what's going on, on the, over those dates, too, you know, on the system. We, we have uh, tens of thousands of big events going on in every city they, that's all proprietary information to us and how it affects rate in that city so we could really educate uh, our groups on, on how they're going to get the best price in that city um, based on the dates and, the, and what they're looking for. Terrific. So um, you said you raised a little bit of angel money but more or less grew, organic, grew organically. Uh, what was the amount of angel financing that you took? So we... It was, you know, relatively small by today's standards. Luckily, the, the um, Did you drop off? We can't hear you. Oh, do you got me now? Do you got me now? Yes. You got oh, it okay, now. Go. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, so it was, it was six figures. <laughs> that, that wasn't on purpose. You know, all of a sudden we start talking money and, <laughs> and the, uh, you can't hear me. No. Uh, <laughs> so it, it, it wasn't seven figures. It, it was six figures. I, I can't really say the exact amount, but it was, it's small by by uh, today's standards of the money that, that's out there. But luckily, the Internet was a lot more cash-friendly at the, at the time. You know, what we would cost a dollar fifty a click now, and the advertising was, you know, one-tenth or one-fifteenth that back then. So we could make the money go a lot further. And uh, eventually, though, you bought out your angel investors, and today you own, you and the management own the company 100%. Tell us a bit more about how did that happen, what was the thinking behind that, and so forth. Sure. Yeah, so, you know, we, we've done really well uh, growing the company, and, uh, uh, you know, it was just time for the angel funders to take 
some of those gains off the table, and uh, it allowed us to reissue those shares to all our employees. And uh, now we have an employee equity pool, and uh, now all our employees uh, are, are vested in the company, so we all have the same vision, and we can say we're 100% employee-owned right now. Okay. And um, was it difficult to negotiate with the angels to take them out? Were they willing to cash out? What was the what was that process? What was the what were the dynamics of that process? I mean, it was uh, it's tough like any negotiation, you know. I mean, especially when uh, bigger money's on, on the line, it, it's always going to be uh, a tougher negotiation. So. Uh, you know, it, it, it took place over months, but, uh, but yeah, all parties reached uh, reach agreements, and, you know, yeah, everybody's uh, happy. So it's good. Yeah. So you did one other piece of financial engineering that I found fascinating when we talked uh, for the Entrepreneur Journeys interview, which is you bought real estate and used that real estate to borrow money against for working capital. Talk a little bit about... What that, that's an unorthodox strategy in the uh, you know venture style startup business, but it sounds like it went it worked out very well for you. So please talk about that a bit. It did work out really well. Um, yeah, we kind of got uh, caught up in the real estate boom that everybody else did too. So you know we were in uh, downtown San Diego as our headquarters back then, and. Uh, you know, new buildings were going up left and right, and and what seemed like amazing deals since you know real estate was was increasing 10 to 20 percent in value every year was hey let's grab some of this and we did, and uh, we put our office space uh, in there and then as we grew we bought new office space and then put more you know it got bigger and bigger and bigger, so eventually we ended up moving our headquarters to to West Palm Beach where we are now and I should say that we do we do lease. Uh, uh, that space now, but but we we amassed some real estate, and then it ended up working out really well for us because when uh, you know interest rates got really low after the debt crisis, we were able to to uh, get some really good debt financing to help grow the company too, uh, based on uh, all this collateral that we had um, from from. And that's non dilutive. Can you say again. That financing is non dilutive. Yes, right, a non-dilutive. This is a very, very, very good point because it's amazing how fast the equity actually will go. You know, people think the money, it sounds like a lot, but it's also amazing how fast you can spend it and uh, you can't go and create more equity once it's gone. Uh, so, yeah, uh, holding on to it is important, and, uh, and right now we happen to be in a really good space where uh, debt, is, you know, interest rates are so low. So, so the debt is very reasonable. Um, so, with the right cash flows and uh, everything else, you can finance the company's growth pretty nicely on the on the debt side. And we have a very strong banking relationship with PNC in um, uh, the U.S. and then RBS in the in the U.K. So, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, well. So now you're at about twenty-five million dollars in revenue, growing twenty percent year over year. You have a you have a pretty solid company. You have no difficulty getting bank financing. Where to from here? What 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 is on your mind? Of course, you know we we see an incredible bubble market right now where companies are raising money like crazy, and this is equity money. Um, you know they're basically signing off their life through liquidation preferences to get to a billion dollar valuation and blah blah blah. Your thought process seems to be very different and very uh, down to earth compared to what's going on in Silicon Valley today or in the broader market with this unicorn mania. Talk to us about how you think about your next phase. Well, we still we we also hope to be a billion dollar company one day. Um, you know, at the fact that we were we're ten percent margin business. You know the revenues that we're actually producing in the industry are a lot bigger than than the 25 million that that we were recording as our working capital. Um, yeah. as, you know, we were talking about as I said earlier in the in the group hotel contracts and the room revenue only. We're contracting a half a billion dollars, and we know that 
our groups are spending, you know, two times more on food and beverage at their hotel at the hotels than just their room revenue. I mean, you can imagine if you were doing a wedding at a hotel, you know, the the cost of the rooms are minimal compared to what you're going to pay for the reception and everything else. So, you know, our groups are producing a lot more revenue than just that that half a billion dollars that we're recording. But our grow you know, goal is to keep growing 25% to, to 50% and top line year over year. And, and soon, you know, that 25 million, we hope to be uh, uh, 50 million and then eventually 75 to 100 million. And then right in, in our direct contribution of room revenue will be uh, over a billion dollars for our hotels. And then when we take in the F&B, it'll be 3 billion uh, total. So two billion of F and B and and food and beverage is what I mean by F and B, um, uh, and and then one billion of of, of hotel room. But that's revenue. that's a gross. That's not that's not your revenue, so to speak. That's the gross merchant gross uh, well, volume right now, that you're we're doing. At half a billion for for the uh, room revenue contracted at hotels. Room revenue contracted. Yeah, but that's not your revenue though. That's the hotel's revenue. No, oh, because we're not the merchant of record. I mean, our 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 groups are all paying uh, the hotels directly. So yeah, we don't record that as as right. our revenue. But yeah, so reduced. The... I mean, it's still. I mean, that revenue means something to our hotel par partners, which is our suppliers. So I I I'd, I'd say that revenue is is important as as a judge to what it. But I get I kind of get what you're saying, which is, you know, if we were to be valued just based on. Bankering, you know, what bankers would value at us, we're not that, you know, important uh, in terms of that that number. But in our industry, we are important. And, and frankly, I don't. You're very that. important. I, I, I actually not. I'm not saying at all. I'm not by any, um, you know, stretch of imagination saying you're not important. I'm very, very. Uh, appreciative of what you have done, and I admire what you've done. So I think, for, but my point is, what you have done, if you extrapolate that out, let's say, you know, you're at 25 million revenue right now, you know, in some number of years from here, whether it's five years or six years, I don't know exactly how you're going to grow going forward and what strategies are you going to implement. But if you get 200 million dollars in revenue, it can show a growth rate of about, you know, 40, 50 percent. Chances are you would be you would qualify for a billion dollar valuation based on banker assessments. Not that it matters, but but I'm saying that you have built a solid company and you're on the trajectory to build a solid company that is comparable in um, you know impact, maybe a little bit slower. You haven't built a billion dollar company, billion dollar market cap company in five years. Who cares? You don't need to. Um, but no, no, but it's a, you've built a significant company. To tell you where I come from exactly, you know, we didn't build the company for bankers. We didn't build the company no. for financiers. We built it for customers and suppliers. So, you know, when I think about what the hotels think about what we're doing, that's important to me. When I think about what my customers think about what we're doing for them, that's important to me. When I think about what our partners at our, the different OTAs think of us, that's important to me. Our partners with, with the pro sports teams that we work with, they matter, yep. but I tell you what, I've never lost sleep on what any bankers ever thought so far, knock on wood. Hallelujah. But, Hallelujah. But I, <laughs> this is completely in tune with the philosophy that we believe in at One Million by One Million. Our definition of entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits, financing, exits, valuation, all these are optional. These are not core entrepreneurship issues. The problem, Tim, is that the the world has a disease, and you'll see an article from me next week on this topic, is that the world has this disease that entrepreneurship, it equates entrepreneurship with capital and all the associated exit, uh, valuation, unicorn mania, all this crap, and, and that's what's confusing young entrepreneurs all over the world. By the way, this used to be a localized Silicon Valley disease. Now it's become a globalized you know, disease that Silicon Valley has successfully exported to, the, to every ecosystem in the world. Everybody is thinking the same way. Everybody is thinking like lemmings that everybody should run after venture capital. This is a huge, huge problem. So a question to you, are you thinking about exit? Does it matter to you? Do you worry about exit? 
No, no. Uh, building building a, a better company always for my employees and and for our customers and our partners. Like I said, that's that's our goal that we work on every day. And uh, yeah, no, exit is not it is not something that I spend a lot of time focusing on right now. So 25%, 50% growth is because all of our partners are publicly traded and, and they, uh, they have to, to adhere to that kind of growth strategy. And so we have to support them in that way. So, so growth is good. But growth we should see if we're doing right by our employees and our customers and our suppliers. We should be growing. Uh, yeah. If we're not growing, then, then we're dying, as the old quote says. I totally agree with it. If you're not growing, you're dying because it shows you're not – you're not uh, creating enthusiasm for for what you do and for your product and for your people and everything else. And and enthusiasm is, is something that I have, you know, a passion for 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 the business. You know, I, and that's what I measure it by. You know, and then there's other ways to call it net promoter score, which we have a 70% net promoter score that we're happy to brag about. Um, we have a I have 100% approval on Glassdoor. As a CEO, happy to brag about that, 100%. You know, I can't go wrong with that. So, um, what do we have? We have really high uh, customer service ratings online for the company, 4.3 out of out of five. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's looking. And really can good. you grow to the extent that you are aspiring to grow in the next, you know, foreseeable future? I guess um, organically, or do you need infusion of capital to achieve those kinds of growth rates? I think we we would definitely have grown organically for the last 13 years, and we will grow organically. Uh, you know, capital can always increase, but at what cost is always the question, and to increase that growth. Um, you know, we have a belief that if we build a, the best product out there, people will find us, though, too. So, you know, we're still heavy believers in that. And, and that's, we, sh we show that from our, our, like I was saying, that promoter score, the people who repeat to use us and tell their friends. So that's always, you know. So today you sit in this enviable position where I'm sure you're being offered capital by lots of different investors. How do you think about that? Do you, do you even consider capital? What is, what is the thought process? as you're processing these interests from investors? So we have lots of conversations. Um, as I just said with a uh, previous interview we've had before, you know, I'm always happy to talk um, with them because, uh, you know, some of the smartest people in the world are on the financing uh, industry and, and banking industry. So you'll never go wrong with having a conversation with them, not only to – a lot of times they know your industry really well. They know other industries and can give you so much, so much, you know, insight into what other people are doing and what might work for you and problems you may encounter. You know, to take some some money from some of them that are really, really well connected, kick along with that too, because then they make an introduction to help you grow your business faster and everything else. So, uh, you know, they they're great at what they do, and I can't say one bad thing about. The you know the VC market out there, the private equity market. Uh, the, U, the U.S. especially has the the greatest you know uh, private equity and VC market in the world. Uh, and and look at the GDP growth and look at the entrepreneurship we have in the U.S. that they don't have anywhere else. And all the other countries are jealous of it of it. So why how could I ever say anything bad about that? And you know I mean it's it's great. It's a great industry and it's it's filled with talented, really hardworking people. Uh, that probably uh, get less sleep than I do, and that's and travel more than I do, which is which is pretty hard to compete with. Um, but you know, for for what we were saying before, we 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 have a, a goal, and we we have a very talented executive um, board uh, made up of a lot of people that have a lot of experience in the industry. So we know that if we if we execute correctly every day and build the that's product, then we'll get there for what we need to do organically too. So, so we want to take the right capital at the right time if it ever presents itself. But it would have to be, you know, uh, uh, it would be tough to put the deal together. It won't be overnight. Let's put it that way. We did build work for 13 years to make make a quick quick deal on it on an equity basis. You get what I'm saying? 
Great. Tim, let's, uh, let's talk to some of the entrepreneurs in the room. Um, that was an excellent conversation. And folks in the audience, please note what he's saying. I, you know, the reason I invite people like Tim with very grounded, very, uh, you know, fundamentals oriented value systems on the show is to expose you to a different value system than what you're seeing in the media most of the time about these unicorns and raising shitloads of money and then, you know, imploding in the, uh, you know, public market or even in the late stage public private market. Um, there's a lot of huge burn rate businesses out there right now funded by investor capital producing no revenues, no profits, and, and this is not the kind of company we are interested in supporting you to build. We focus heavily on this simple strategy, simple equation, entrepreneurship equals customers, revenues, and profits. And please, if you decide to work with us in the 1M1M program, please note that that is going to be the guiding philosophy of the program. Financing is fine. We, we are not at all averse to financing. We work with plenty of investors. In fact, the company that has uh, raised the maximum money in our uh, com in our program actually has raised close to $100 million. We're not at all averse to any of that, but but not at the cost of losing your focus on customers' revenues and profits. Okay, let's look at the entrepreneurs and uh, talk to some of them. Ritesh, George, you are the first presenter. Please unmute your line, and uh, Tim is going to stay for the mentoring section. Go ahead, Ritesh. Hey, uh, Sama, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Hey, good morning. Thanks for this opportunity to present uh, our startup, the VR Exchange. My name is Ritesh Jod. I'm one of the co-founders, and I'm working as a CTO of the VR Exchange, an online marketplace where craft beer lovers can find and acquire any beer they want. Um, so basically, this is a platform for craft beer lovers. So um, myself and my co-founders are really into craft beer, and one of the, mm -hmm. the, the, one of the problem that we are trying to solve is how to get into the, the, the beer that we love, because the mm -hmm. uh, craft beer distribution is very limited, mostly to the local option. So, for example, the Heady Chopper uh, is one of the top uh, rated craft beer IPA, double IPA, is limited into the, the Vermont area only. Um, and so people, specifically, it is, it is a highly rated uh, craft beer, but nobody in the in, in the world can get into it unless, you know, uh, someone sends that uh, beer over to them. So basically, so we are, if we, you were to, hold on, question here. If sure. you were to get a distributor in Vermont to work with you, would they be allowed to ship all over the country or all over the world? Or is uh, there seems to be licenses and so forth involved, yeah? Absolutely. Great question. Yes, there are state uh, uh, as well as, uh, you know, national-wide licenses and regulations, uh, but uh, there are licensed vendors and beer bottle shop, show, uh, I'm sorry, bottle shops that are allowed to, uh, you know, ship the beer. But it, it is it's okay. not widespread. Um, of course, these are like brick-and-mortar shops in that area. They don't have the, you know, big power and capacity to, you know, do an online uh you know, uh, beer selling website and, you know, all the inventory uh, management. Everything. It's, it's kind of like uh, too much for the, those kind of stocks to do that. And uh, the, the beer, uh, the breweries itself cannot also do the, the kind of direct shipping. So it is going to a three-tier uh, model. So that is a classic mm -hmm. problem in, in, in craft beer. But people are always willing to, uh, you know, look for opportunities to uh, get the beer they want. Um, you know, uh, we have seen people internationally also looking for, you know, some of the top-rated beer in, in U.S. Uh, but at least initially, we had this problem of cost-to-cost, -cost, uh, you know, uh, the beer uh, availability issue, right? So, for example, someone in California wanted to get to this top-rated beer that is produced in, in Boston, uh, you know, or uh, Florida or somewhere. So the only way that you can get it right now is through an uh, option, uh, you know, basically it's, it's through our uh, uh, process called uh, beer trading, which is basically a user-to-user -user, uh, trading. So, like, I go and buy the beer that, uh, you know, I get in my area, um, I, and I basically swap with a, a friend of mine uh, who, is, who is sitting on the other side of the uh, country, right? And uh, oh, I, I have to manage, yeah. So, so you so don't that, have the small the businesses part. directly selling on your exchange. It's consumers who are buying from those distributors or or sellers, and then then 
swapping on your exchange. Is that what you're saying? That 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 is the version one. I'll be talking about our our next uh, you know uh, feature also, which talks about the uh, the the uh, uh, the B2C market as well. So at least I just want to say that this is how Beer Exchange tra started as a trading beer platform, and how we okay. achieved uh, um, you know gaining users is just only through word of mouth, uh, you know, marketing, and you know people are really really willing to uh, you know uh, put their effort into promoting our product. So in in last one year since we launched our beta, we have like 13,000 users um, uh, on on our platform who are actively uh, looking for uh, you know people on the other side of the equation to find the beer, right? And we launched yeah. uh, a iOS app, and we have volunteers uh, again in the, from the craft beer community who are promoting us. But just to tell you, this is a version one where it is only you know user to user uh, you know trading. Uh, but obviously, this is not you know, going to meet like everyone's demand, and definitely we are looking forward to extend it to the, the retail uh, section as well. That is our, our next slide. Mm -hmm. for, but for now, we have premium accounts, which is a premium model, like uh, free users. If anybody can sign up free, but there's a premium account where, where they get like, you know, additional features like, uh, you know, seller management, your alerts, and, you know, uh, some, some additional features that we provided, and some basic mm -hmm. advertisement on, on the free uh, version. And we also have an online store where, where we have some branded merchandise like the glasses and openers and, and, and costures. So that's, that's the current platform. Now, what we are looking for to expand, this is going to be our major disruption in this, uh, you know, the beer distribution uh, scene. This is the, we call the, uh, the BEX e-commerce platform. BEX is uh, beer exchange uh, short form. And uh, mm -hmm. so the, the, the idea that we are, uh, in a uh, basically, um, you know, uh, promoting is now uh, you can do this like through different channels, but the most efficient way to purchase a beer through will be through the beer exchange because we already have the existing data and also the users who are really interested in, in, in getting this beer. So if you are, uh, if you have a uh, retailer who is basically having this uh, inventory, they can directly come on, on board and start selling right away. Right. This is the biggest, yeah. uh, you know, advantage for anybody who's who's uh, who wants to manage their inventory on their exchange. So that's that's our uh, beer e-commerce platform offer. So mm -hmm. you go to the next slide, please. Uh, sure. Yeah. So so the main advantage here, right? Uh, like anybody who's coming into our platform, they can you know open up their own individual stores within our uh, platform itself. So it, it's nothing but just come to the site, create your inventory, what you have as a store owner, and immediately you get access to all our existing user base because they're searching for the beer. They're immediately finding, okay, now these stores are also available who are selling this beer so I can directly buy from them in addition to, like, you know, trying to uh, trade with a friend on the other side of the uh, equation. So this is, this is the biggest uh, proposition that we have right now, and we are going through our, uh, you know, pilot phase uh, of the, the the beer exchange uh, e-commerce platform. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So, so are you generating revenue on the platform right now? Sure, yes. So so as I said, uh, right now, just, just before this pilot program kicked on, uh, we had only the trading platform, which is which has two revenue streams. One is the premium uh, accounts. Uh, so the users pay like a monthly recurring uh, fee to become like a, a premium members. And the other uh, source of revenue for us is, is the uh, advertising, right? So there's, uh, uh, you know, these are the only. So two you're not doing a transaction-based exchange. This is not a transaction-based exchange. So that's what we are coming into the e-commerce, right? Until the the e-commerce platform is there, oh, we see. cannot do that because the user to user, they are not allowed to sell, uh, you know, any beer, right? It is more like a, you know, a, a convenient platform or an efficient platform, right? Because they are not licensed so to the sell it. So. For the consumers, exactly. you have a subscription model, premium subscription model, and then for retailers, you're going to do the transaction revenue business. Absolutely, absolutely, yep. So okay. our pilot program, we just kicked on, and two stores who are uh, already on board, and, and we started you know, the, the process last, last month. So as I said, yeah. we have two major revenue streams now. Uh, yeah, as yeah. I said, uh, the, the, the users uh, part of it is not going to be that much significant, uh, it is advertising in a premium model, but the where we are going to, you know, looking for, uh, you know, expansion is in the retail stores. Like we'll have a yeah. subscription model and the transaction. That's going to be the bulk of the business. Yep, 
So that's what we are. It's going to be actually a lot more than 70%. I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's 95% of your percentage. <laughs> I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, but we have to start somewhere. So um, we are we are looking for that market. And uh, and if you look at the the market size itself, it, the the top tier retail market is about 20 billion at this point, and it has been growing like almost double in size in in last three years. So we see that it is it's a growing market, and you know uh, uh, consumer tastes are shifting from uh, from the macro. We have people are ready to try out new flavors and, you know, new uh, innovative uh, beers that are produced by these 3,500 plus craft beer breweries uh, in U.S. And also, as I said, mm -hmm. internationally also, there's a huge market for U.S., uh, you know, craft beer. So it's, it's, it's a significant. Belgian beer. I think market. Belgian beer is, is one of the most in demand, right? Absolutely, yeah. So that, that used to be the traditional way. Uh, people used to like okay, but unless uh, like you expose this uh, in a craft beer market, they won't know like what is what's out there, right? So we are also trying to promote the the industry itself by giving as much boost to the the craft beer industry and and, and innovation. So in order to take it uh, forward, we are we are also looking for uh, you know uh, fundraising. Uh, what we are uh, right now looking at again, this is one area I would look for advice and uh, how, you know how should we. Uh, raise. We haven't really raised any any money. Like it's, it's at this point, it's mostly like our you know, startup uh, partners have pulled the money, and we had uh, one of the partner uh, did small seed investment. But I believe uh, at this point, we are looking for about 500,000 as our seed uh, investment. Um, you know, so uh, from a potential investor, and uh, we are looking for save uh, uh, as a, as an option um, for for generating this and. Uh, we, we 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 have some plans to uh, you know expand our our market uh, our product sorry and 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 that's that's basically captured in our next slide uh, so basically we we plan to spend uh, you know enhancing our platform and uh, add a iOS application and we have uh, uh, also planned to spend on on marketing and and also sales and um, other other side of the equation right so. We definitely have uh, to get some some additional funding to take it to the next level, but we believe it's going to be you know uh, it's going to be a uh, huge once we get go there. So, um, what is the market size? What's the uh, bottom up TAM? This is a top down number. This is this doesn't say anything to an investor. What is the bottom up market size for what you're trying so, to do? So, uh, so again, uh, as I said, if you if you, um, if you have the yeah, uh, two minutes, if we can go to the last slide, and there's uh, some numbers that we have put together. Uh, this is no, not this one. Actually, uh, the very last slide. Uh, whether we have that here? Uh, it's actually the last one. The very last slide. I just put. Okay, so. So here is like uh, you know the the market size overall market size that we are we are targeting right uh, from an overall uh, uh, crop beer market uh, perspective and and what is basically growing. So as I said, there is uh, about Rupesh, like uh, three thousand. Sure. This is not a, a bottom up market analysis. That's one of the things you need to. Fa I can't tell whether this is a venture style fundable company or not without a you know, TAM analysis of the bottom up. Um, okay. And these numbers don't present that, so you may want to first figure out. That's that's one of the key numbers that investors look for in figuring out whether they want to fund you or not. So without that number, I can't even assess if this is fundable or not. Sure, I get that. So as I said, like our our IELT program just just started, and we are still you know figuring out what is our you know best. Uh, uh, you know, positioning in terms of what will be the subscription model and how, what will be our, you know, percentage of the, you know, uh, the sales and things like that. But we are very much optimistic about coming up with that number to put together how will be our runway for, for the first year and how, how much revenue that we can generate per year and things like that. So we, we are still working on that at this point. Um, okay. Well, so if you decide, uh, I'll, you know, spend some time later on on how we work with entrepreneurs. So if you decide to work further with 1M, 1M, uh, you will know exactly how to do that, but that's going to be one of the things that I will certainly make you work on if you decide to work with us. Absolutely. I would I would definitely look forward to it. Thanks, uh, Shramana, for that uh, input. Yeah.
All right. Thank you. Amandeep Patia is next. Thank you, Ritesh. Please unmute your line, Amandeep. Uh, yeah, morning, Padma. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Yeah. Go ahead. So, good morning, and we are excited to be on this forum. Uh, so, we are uh, a startup uh, in the online laundry space in India. Uh, starting, uh, started our services in last uh, three, four months in the city of Pune. And uh, so basically, we wanted to be an online marketplace uh, aggregator where we uh, have the customer app, uh, mobile app. We are only mobile app uh, platform where we face the customer, we become the customer facing thing and uh, we aggregate the vendors on our platform. Uh, we also own the delivery team, uh, delivery teams, and uh, to make the experience consistent. Next slide, please. Okay. So basically, we are two co-founders, uh, myself and another guy, uh, Subhashish. Uh, I am mostly looking into strategy and growth, while he is looking into the technology marketing uh, part. Yeah. And who's so looking at the uh, uh, operation? Sounds like there is a to-do online land, uh, laundry. Uh, order and delivery, that's going to be a massive uh, operational issue. So at present, yeah, so at present basically we are, we both are uh, sharing the operations part in the just, uh, for the starting uh, stuff, but uh, the technology basically he is, uh, Subhashi is looking into the technology like we have a technology team, so he is just spending some time there. Uh, he is mostly looking into the operations part for this. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, so this is like our app screens. I mean, in, uh, got squeezed a bit, but so this is uh, where you we provide the screens to register and place their orders. We made sure that our like the placing an order should be very quick. So generally, it takes less than thirty seconds to place the order. And uh, so at present, like we started some somewhere in May of two thousand fifteen. And till date, we have all added around 1,200 to 1,300 customers, and we started generating revenue from day one. Uh, we're and this getting is all in happening in Pune? From the customer. Yes. In fact, we okay. started from one area of Pune only to uh, gain the density, because we think that in this particular business, the unit economics, if you want to achieve, uh, you need Word to concentrate more on the density part. Yeah. Word of mouth, operational efficiency, all of those, yeah, sure. Yes, yes. So um, I don't know about what Tim is thinking about your business. My uh, first thing that comes to my mind is unit economics. How are the unit economics uh, structured in your yes. business? Yes, so this unit economics where we uh, figured it out, right? That's why we did not uh, start spreading out there in the uh, uh, spreading out in the entire city. We started with one particular area, which is a bit dense, say around 30,000 apartment type of area, where we uh, realized that we get around 30, 25 to 35 percent margin revenue mar uh, margins from our vendors, right? And then we uh, do all the delivery stuff and all. So at around 3,000 customers, which we define as a unit. So at around 3,000 customers, we break even, basically. And uh, because of this efficiency at the density built in, mm -hmm. uh, at, we uh, calculated that around one customer spends around 600 bucks on uh, the laundry services in India, at least in, especially in this part of the uh, country. And uh, out of this, we get around 30% 30, 30 say on the average margins. And when we do our operations with the density kicking in, at around 3,000, Customer, which we define as a unit, we break even in front the unit economics. And and if you extrapolate that forward, what is the business that you're trying to build? So break even is one milestone for sure. Um, what, where does the business start to be interesting? People don't build businesses just to do break even businesses, right? People want to make profit. So at what point are you generating so, I mean, a yeah, you know, healthy profit? Yeah, so not the break even actually. The break even happened before. At 3,000, we start making around 10% margins. So this is like one unit basically. Now, if this is a very uh, smaller part of our area, if you just look at the entire city of Pune with the population around 25 lakhs, which can spend on this, and if, even if we capture 10% of that particular market, then 
where we calculate we will be generating around net margins of around 12% uh, type of thing. Uh, if you just uh, replicate uh, this entire model. Your target audience is a very small segment of that 25 lakh population. Um, this is, I mean, your uh, your target segment is, uh, is are the people who are tech savvy, who are comfortable doing these things, have mm -hmm. the budget, no, no. and, and so I the mean, it's a... No, so the population of Pune is around a crore, one, one, one CR, and we are talking about out of this around 20 to 25 lakhs are like that, like in the IT professionals alone only are around 15 lakhs there, and then there are various segments, so we took 25 lakhs is the thing, and out of that we are trying to just capture 10%, which is a bit more conservative for us. Uh, then if you just see the laundry market itself in India, at present we are only targeting the retail industry, we are not even going towards the commercial sites. So even in this particular stiff, Pune is a bit mid side city, so if you move to a city like Bangalore or uh, Mumbai or NCR, this thing changes a bit. So in the initial three months we have got a uh, some good traction and in fact we are uh, making sort of good revenue and uh, able, we are just reaching to that uh, figure of 3,000, maybe in the next two, three months. Okay. So that is what we That's are working good. on. Definitely a good milestone to get to. So what are your questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so our questions are like we uh, we actually uh, sort of, we realize that in this particular business, like there are multiple players now coming up to, re to this particular uh, we need to scale fast. We really need to scale fast so that we can not only achieve the Pune faster as well as move into the other parts of the country, as well as introducing premium services with the name of Preso Prime, which we will be introducing, where we have got some tractions from the some luxury players and people also want to get into those type of premium things. So our push, uh, our goal is basically to raise some money so that we start scaling more faster. Now we have done it in one particular area, we just need to replicate it across. So one question of ours is like, um, which actually I was speaking to some of the, if is also in this particular, uh, for the raising the next round, where the question was coming that do you guys really want to, at present we are not owning any facilities for doing the dry cleaning or uh, laundry stuff, like we do aggregate. So do you guys really want to, aggregate only across country or want to own your own facilities, which at present we do not want to. So our question would be on this side, the challenges of doing it ourselves or doing it in an aggregated way. That depends on how reliable your, uh, uh, your supply chain is. Tim, do you want to take that question? Well, yeah, Pardon? I have questions of my own. I, I do, so is this, you know, um, you're aggregating consumers for for organized laundry services, or is this peer to peer where, you know, no. I, you know, potentially will might want to do some loads of laundry for a fee, and I, you know, like an Uber model or or Airbnb. No, it's local local retailers, local retail service. Local retailers. Okay. Um, so that's why he says you need three thousand. Uh, users in order to start breaking even because that's um, wait I didn't get that part of it why why do you need three thousand orders to break even is that to cover your overheads of staff you need in that city to what take the laundry from the person's house to the uh, laundromat yeah it's mostly because of that uh, because we are providing the delivery services so it's mostly to cover that particular cost and certain other bit operation costs. So 3,000 would be making margins, I mean less than even 3,000 will break even in a particular area where the density stuff is there. Well, why, did you, why don't you just partner up with laundromats that would pick up the laundry themselves? There's, there's, I know in London there's lots of laundromats that, that uh, do delivery and pick up. So if you, if you take that expense out of it, then you probably don't need as much money to scale, right? And then you can always add that additional service later when you start to break even um, and start to have profits. Very good Why point. Make... Yeah, we also explored we explored that thing, and problem is that like in in India, the with the this market is very much organized, and the type of players who are there are not at all professional. So what they do is they do not make the commitment of time at all, which is the convenience is our biggest selling point, but they are not making it. So we also like, they're not reliable. Yeah, they are not reliable. 
So that's why we have to initially take it. If are they reliable like to that, actually do the laundry work? Yes, yes, they are. I mean, there are certain players who are uh, committing to our vendor partnership in terms of quality and something. So there are different type of services and we have tied up with the different type of uh, people. So what anyway, what we are doing is uh, for very regular type of services like irony, we are tying up with people who are very, very closer to the societies. So in any case, our uh, this transit costs reduces there. And tomorrow, if they become more organized, they can provide us the delivery thing, we will definitely do this. But we are experimenting with all the models at present. Okay, well, um, you know, like I said, and like Tim said earlier in the, in the session, is that if you can get further with validation, with execution, with actual revenues and not run after money, you will build a more solid business. There is, you know, the truth is right now, there is a bubble market going on. So a lot of stuff are getting funded and, and you may be able to ride the wave of that funding. The thing that worries me, and I'm sure Tim will echo the same sentiment, is that you raise a bunch of money, get into the habit of spending a lot of money, and then when the bubble bursts, which sooner or later it will, you will not be able to raise enough money to be able to cover your burn rate. So that's something that we, we are very concerned about, especially in businesses like yours, which are, you know, there's not a lot of technology leverage. It's an operations business. It's a, there's not a technology business. This is a, essentially a, a, you know, hybrid operations business. It's like Uber. Uber is not a technology business. It's got a technology front end, but it's not a technology business. These are very operations heavy, people heavy businesses, especially if you're doing all the distribution, all the, shipping and handling yourself. And now you're even talking about doing the actual laundry yourself, which is gonna add yet another layer of complexity to your operations. And, and it's not clear to me that you or your co-founder have the expertise to scale stuff like that. So if I were considering investing in this, I those are questions that I would ask. Is that who's gonna yes, manage that immense operational complexity of scaling this business? Right. So. Uh, we do not want to like own our own laundry stuff. That's uh, that is what we are resisting. That we do not want to. We just want to aggregate. We do not want to go into that site. And at present, uh, whenever we are talking to any other vendors, big vendors, they are fine because they do not want to come to the retail site. So they are giving us that leverage. And we tried to expand it, scale it in three areas of Pune. Now we are now operating in three areas. We just started with one area, which is now working fine because our acquisition cost because of this regular service is bit low. So we are able to add 60% of our customers to referral now. Mm -hmm. So that part we're taking care of. Now the scaling thing, which we... Because that would be very applicable to, you know, how risky getting into a new market is. If you need 3,000 people to, to break even in a market, what's your acquisition cost per, per customer? So at present, it's like coming uh, to around... 200 Indian rupees, but we are trying to get it up to say 100 or 50 through referrals and something, which is uh, about three dollars getting down. Yeah. And what is the $3. lifetime yeah. customer value of each of these? That is like once we get achieve the customer at present, like they keep ordering four orders, so they keep give us a revenue of around 500, say uh, 10 dollars uh, every month, and they'll continue to give it uh, to whatever times. They do five hundred and ten dollars every month. No, not on laundry, not in India. Ten dollars every month, yeah. Ten dollars every month. Yeah. And and your assumption on how long you're going to hold on to that customer? Uh, I mean, at present we have not lost anything. I mean, if you just look at our uh, this. Uh, we have not lost much customers, even five or ten percent. So last three months, we they are they are with us. So they have given us around thirty thirty five dollars. So I think that's the thing that you're going to need to prove out through execution before investors are going to be interested. And, and I'm not talking about bubble investors. Bubble investors get invested in a lot of things and they will dump you and move on the minute the bubble is over. But a, a real investor who wants to stay with you long term will want to know if you're spending $3, $4 to acquire a customer, um, and let's say you're getting $10 a month, 
for maybe if is is the life can you hold on to a customer for let's say three years that's you know three hundred and sixty dollars so if you can spend three four dollars and get a three hundred and sixty three hundred fifty four hundred dollars lifetime customer value that's a you know that's a reasonable scenario um and and mm -hmm. if you can do it at scale and be able to manage all the operations so so my take is that you're gonna to need to grow this organically quite a bit further to show you know what is the quality of the revenue and what is your capacity right. in managing the complexity on the operation side right and it sounds like yeah. you can do it you know how, what does it cost to get you to 3000 uh, consumers and break even what is the investment needed to get to that if they're not that would correct sorry did they say they were profitable right now or no yeah, I think you've no, right already now reached are, 3,000. Uh, right Again? Right now we are not profitable because now we have around 1,000 customers out of which say uh, 600 are actively ordering with us. So now at present we are not profitable because uh, uh, we have a delivery team which is a bit more than, which is not optimized yet. That of it optimization level will come with a bit of density and that is what we are trying to prove. If I heard you but, correctly. Uh, can it, wait, wait, just to interrupt you real quick. If I heard you correctly, you can acquire a new customer for around three dollars. You got a thousand customers. You right. only need two two thousand more customers to break even. So a six thousand dollar investment is all you need to break even. Am I wrong on that? Hello. A uh, bit more than I think. Uh, yeah, I think a bit more than this uh, because of our initial. Uh, uh, the team delivery team which we are holding at present yeah, so we just need at that, at, at that but still it's not that much right no, no not that like much. so we are not making that much of loss I did it on some credit cards I did I mean <laughs> probably burned through around 50, you're gonna have to Amandeep. You're gonna have to do this yep. with your own money or friends and family money, and somehow or the other cobble together the initial um, funding to be able to get get to break even and and really play this thing out. Right now, this is not a fundable situation, and and I don't even recommend okay. you're trying to fund it at this point. It's not the right point to even try to fund it. Yeah, you'll give away too much equity for, for uh, too much of your labor. Not just that. It's kind of it doesn't have the metrics to get any fun, any real investor attention, you know. Yeah. So this is a this is, is a phase where it's either friends or family or your own savings or you know somehow as you said credit cards or that kind of funding. Right. But keep executing. I think the most important thing, and you're doing that already, you're basically executing and you're learning the business, you're optimizing the business and, and really understanding the unit economics as evidence, not as speculation. And that's really what investors yeah. would look for if you choose to go the investor route. Right. So okay. we basically consider this in terms of uh, number of hours per day, which we are doing around 50, 60 per day today, which we want to scale up to 300 uh, maybe in the next two months. Okay. That's fair. That's reasonable. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Mandeep Patel, you're up next. Thank you, Amandeep. Hey, hi, hi, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey, hi. Thank, thanks for having me here. So uh, the, my whole idea is all about, you know, uh, in India, people are facing all sort of problem like cash change and you know they have to transact everywhere in cash irrespective of the places like you know users are not going to take uber or roll out on for their day-to-day -day transportation so my whole idea is about you know uh, mobile payments where a user or a merchant can accept any amount of money via their mobile using their credit or debit cards so i think in india have very low penetration of credit cards but still there are many users, like as of latest data, there are three to four million user, uh, credit card users in India. 
So let's mm-hmm. say why there is a market for such thing. Like India have you know somewhere around approximately 15 million retail stores, and among them only one million are equipped with POS terminals. So 14 million are still there who can who don't have any type of service to accept the payment via credit or debit cards. Even if mm-hmm. you know, let's say that all those one million instruments are generating only cashless instrument transaction are only three percent. Uh, this is this is only about you know retail payments or retail outlets. What about the small food outlets? Because you know India have these you know dabeli wala, pail wala, or chat wala, or they say bada pao wala, small food outlets. Apart from that, you know there are few college canteens or corporate canteens where they do accept payments via cash only. There are few confectionery shops and pan parlor. You know India people are used to smoke in a single single smoke or double smoke. They very few people are used to buy a packet of cigarettes. so all these are the places where they face you know where they have to done online only cash transaction so the, there is there is some latest data about uh, cash transaction uh, average number of transaction or at pos terminal so it's amount only 40 83 rupees per month and on an average you know uh, 83 transactions are only done via single pos and the volume was only 75 million uh, rupees per month so next uh, next slide so total market for it is let's say only four quadrants which are payments from consumer to consumer and business to consumer and business to business so let's say ki payments from consumer to business it represents somewhere around 1800 us billion dollar as per 2015 data and 1800 all only, billion dollars yeah this is this is amount uh, amount of transactions okay this is like too too much of a top down uh it's a, a you can see the uh, first uh, first row second column that's payments from consumer to business so 2015 through it, it is a one that's Sorry. not your market right so that that's like a complete pie in the sky okay keep going why don't you keep going and we'll see because, where it goes uh, that, that that is the uh, that is the market where you know all all the payments are flowing from consumer to business it is respect of the mode like you know it can be a credit card or debit card or it can be a cash transaction so let's say that in 2008 1000 billion us 1000 us billion dollars were uh, circulating in the uh, economy 1000 us billion dollar were there in the economy so it it is like you know a cash transactions or let's say a transaction where which involves a money okay uh, uh so did i make myself clear like uh, why i am addressing that big market like you made yourself clear but not that that entire market is not going to be tech savvy they are not going to have credit cards they are not going to def- so def- 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 definitely that definitely entire market is that that is not but that is the uh, big that is the big thing which can be changed matlab ki i i must not you know ki categorize okay i'll be addressing 10% or 20% of the market that is ideally not possible i have to i i am addressing that much big market so i have to uh, get some pie out of it and uh, you know indian people are used to make the cash transaction so here i am planning to change their habit which is very difficult to do that, that definitely which is very difficult to do and even if i want to change the habit then in that case uh, user have to get something like user there must be some benefits for user to uh, make the transaction via my app so in overall scenario only 4% of the total transaction are carried cashless so let's say if that market is 18000 1800 billion dollar only 32 uh, 320 uh, sorry 32 billion dollar is carried cashless rest is carried in a cash manner and india have somewhere around you know as per latest census data india have 244 million household with households with the ratio of 73 to 23 rural to urban so only 11% urban households are carrying cashless transactions so urban people are those people who who are little bit tech savvy and you know uh, with recent uh, data like you know, just today morning there was a data regarding mobile internet users so india have recently 305 approximately 305 million mobile internet users who access their internet who access internet via their mobile and at an all india level only 0.52% of the total households expenses are carried in cashless instrument so there are there are you know a lot many players who are active into this digital wallet but what they are trying to do is they are just trying to replace the current credit or debit card with the wallet 
and i am trying to replace the current cash transactions into via uh, current cash transaction via uh, uh, my mobile app so why why such thing like why is such a big amount of cash transaction so there is you know low penetration of pos terminal only 1 million pos terminals even indians are you know very uh, secure guy that why should i give hand you my car why should i give you my car to swipe on the machine and all that my urban people might not be like that but you know rural people even are afraid of uh, exposing their credit or debit card numbers to someone else like you know if they will go to some uh, retail outlets and retail out merchant will say that okay give uh, now give me your credit card or debit card i will swipe down and you enter your pin so they they will feel like oh why should i give my card to you just that so my and, and uh, these are, are people for, these are people that you believe one day who are going to accept online digital payment instead of cash i really yeah. have a very hard time with this assumption uh these these are because uh, you know this it will involve only a mobile and a, let's say a barcode reader or a mobile uh, uh, a smartphone from merchant side they do not need to uh, it, it is like you know uh, apple pay but uh, another version of apple pay where user do not need to expose their credit or debit card uh, details yeah sandeep i you know i have really really a hard time with your assumptions just because i know the indian culture i know how uh, how much of a uh, you know not very trusting society uh, the indian society is you know even in e-commerce transactions people don't put their credit cards into uh, e-commerce sites as a result it's, it has to be done as a cash on delivery so cash on delivery definitely uh, So what you're proposing is going to be an uphill task. So let's go to your questions. You seem to have a question here. Uh, so uh, see, uh, before that, I just want to uh, clarify one more thing. That is, uh, you know, I uh, to make people habituate. I just want to uh, target on their day-to-day -day activities. Like you know, a person gets up and will uh, have a breakfast at his place or his or her place. after he will take an auto or taxi to reach somewhere near to his office or near the nearest train station and the most important thing person does is uh, having a food at his office or his college so let's say ki uh, even if in case uh, some some somehow i convert all those day to day activities in a cashless manner like you know ki uh, there are many provision stores who are not able to accept the payments by credit or debit cards and uh, you know uh, there are many people who face the problem of cash like they they do have this uh, cash crunch at their place so even if they are able to uh, you know uh, able to uh, transact few amount of money like able to transact let's say 100 or 200 rupees via credit card then they will be very happy so i have met somewhere around 58 customers still that they are canteen owner or pan parlor or a retail outlets or a food joints 51 of them said yes yeah we will we would like to take such a service because all of them are facing one biggest problem that is cash change so even you know let's say ki 20 to 30 people told me ki uh, we have some uh, contact in nearest place who are giving us a cash change but you know as per indian culture you might be knowing that you know indians are like people who will stand there for a the five minutes to take one or two rupees back they won't let go that one or two rupees So they said, yeah, definitely we are interest. Uh, we are interested in so, this. So, Mandeep, can you yeah. build something and can you show results? Can you actually show transactions? So, uh, so the, 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 this is the problem. Uh, I I just want uh, some guidance upon that because to operate this thing, I'll need a RBI license. which involves uh, approximately uh, which involves a 5 crore of net worth that is that is called a net worth uh, someone not doesn't need to invest or like that it is it has to be a net worth and 1 crore positive bank balance any time so i am stuck there ki how can i secure this thing so and let me translate can, those numbers 5 crores you know it's close to the net worth and and 0.735 hold on panit don't speak over me please that's really annoying yeah. um so those who are listening and are not familiar with the denominations they're using uh five crores what you're saying is that the reserve bank of india which is the the key regulatory authority um requires to for somebody to operate in financial services 
that involves transactions, money transactions and so forth. Um, to give him a license, the regulatory authority requires that that person has a net worth, personal net worth of close to a million dollars and about at least a couple of hundred thousand dollars in the bank. That's what he's saying he doesn't have. And, um, you know, the, the problem here, Vandit, is that you have a chicken and egg because investors are not going to invest in something like this without some, you know, validation. This is the problem with a lot of these payments type of stuff where you have a lot of big investment up front and, uh, and no validation. And uh, investors don't like these kinds of businesses. There are a few investors who would invest and they'd require credentials your personal credentials to be of a certain level that I don't know if you have those credentials. You have, you need to have experience in this domain. You need to have done things, done business before in this domain, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm not sure if you have that. Do you? Uh, see, uh, I, I'm, I'm stuck there only, even if in case I get a chance to uh, tie up with a uh, you uh, type with a company who currently have the license from RBI to operate or else I get a uh, I get a license to operate so I think I, I, I can prove this model like uh, you know uh, who are the customers I have met till date or who are the service uh, customers I have surveyed till date I have literally gone there and I have literally sold my product okay. no, you uh, this is this is the no, you haven't you've talk to them. You have not sold anything. You have not built anything. You have not taken anything to market. That's, that's what is, you know, validation. That's what gives investors confidence. This is just a concept and it's also not very well thought through concept. So I don't think you'll be able to get, raise any money at this point. Given oh, the stage uh, that you've just presented, there's no way you'll be able to raise money. Okay, okay, so uh, what, what should be the ideal scenario to raise the money in that case? Like, uh, you're going to have to, you're going to have to get a business going and, and show that you are generating transactions and are, are proving out the model. But then you're saying you don't have the credentials to win the license from RBI. So you have another chicken and egg problem there. You know, I don't know if you have any rich uncle or somebody who is going to be willing to let you do that. <laughs> You should get a business partner, and uh, there's a site called Founder Dating. You could probably start there. Tim, I'm absolutely against this founder dating concept. Okay. All right, dude, <laughs> right by you. I, I've never used it before. I've just heard of it. Some people like it. What, what don't you like And I'll tell it? you why I'm, I'm so against this founder dating concept. Think about it. You, getting into business with somebody is like a – Many, many year affair, right? You can't really get divorced from your founder. It's more cumbersome than getting a divorce from your founder. Somebody whom you haven't known for very long, you haven't really worked together, you just meet online and you start a business together. I would never do that. Never. De definitely. That, that, that is not even viable option. It, it's not going to work all the time, I mean, but people get married off of Match.com and eHarmony just to play devil's advocate. I mean, I really don't know anything much about it except for it sounds to me like he needs a business partner. Like you said, I mean, he's got these barriers of entry, but he's got a, a passion, so he needs to find himself a business partner. Um, that that, that I agree with. I think your point is, is correct, that you you need a business partner who has, who fulfills the criteria that you're looking for to get your license and, and be able to get a prototype, maybe somebody who is, some, you know, by the way, these kinds of situations almost invariably get handled within the friends and family investors. So your business partner, as Tim points out, is going to be somebody from your friends and family network. It's not going to be some random professional investor who doesn't know you from Adam. De definitely, yeah, right, right. And I, I know that thing, like, you know, okay, uh, when opting for a business partner, it is not like that, you know, okay, I have to opt for money only. Right. It, you can do money. You can do all this. You know, if, if it's somebody experienced and, and, and can guide you and, and so forth, that's, that's how these relationships come together. It's, these relationships don't really come together in vacuum. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, didn't, I didn't get exactly. I beg your pardon. What I, what I said is these kinds of relationships, these kinds of business partnerships where somebody brings some of the missing elements of your situation, 
into the party do not happen in vacuum, they generally happen through your friends and family network. And it could be that right. somebody in your family knows somebody else and trusts somebody else and you get to know that person, that person really starts believing in you. That, that could happen. But you have to work your network, your personal network of people who can vouch for you and who know you, who will make those introductions. It cannot be, it cannot be random. It cannot be and random. And it will not be at this stage, at this stage it will not be professional investors. That, right, right. And that, that thing I, I knew earlier, like it, it cannot be a professional investor unless until that professional investor wants to jump into this transaction system or this transaction market or payment market. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, we're going to move on. Uh, thank you, Vandit. I'm going to spend a few minutes just explaining to you the program, and then we can go to Q and A. Uh, and please, you know, line up your questions. You can start typing your questions in the public chat. You can also introduce yourself. This is also an opportunity to network, get to know one another, who is in the room. Um, where are you dialing from? What project are you working on? What kind of issues you're dealing with? The public chat is already open. You can start using that, and I will open up the line in, in, in just about three, four minutes. So very quickly, if you like what we're doing here in One Million by One Million, please refer serious entrepreneurs into 1M1M. And, and the word serious, you see, is in bold. Because we are not looking for people whose only agenda is to raise some money and then as long as the money lasts, they're entrepreneurs. When the money is gone, they're gone. That's not the kind of entrepreneurs we're looking for. We're looking for entrepreneurs who want to build businesses, put in the real work, including the bootstrapping required to build real organic businesses, and then maybe there will be funding. But, you know, funding is not necessarily the only reason uh, for existence of an entrepreneur. Um, everything we offer is at 1mby1m.com. You'll find that as your key main navigation point into the program. There's a great blog which lots of case studies. Tim's story is a case study in the Entrepreneur Journeys uh, series on the blog. You'll find it there and so you can read that story. You've got a little taste of it from t the show today. There's a lot more detail of that story in that um, you know, Entrepreneur Journeys interview, and there are 600 plus entrepreneurs who have come onto this series and shared their stories and their graphic detailed journeys, their advice, their strategic guidance, and so forth. And that has also yielded the Entrepreneur Journeys book series, which is a series of 12 books that are available on Amazon Kindle. Some of them, the first four, are available as paper books as well from Amazon and in India from Flipkart. And it, each of these volumes double click down on a specific topic and, and gives you perspective on that particular topic. So you could double click down into, for instance, bootstrapping with a paycheck, which is a very common bootstrapping technique. And we recommend that, bootstrapping using services. Then we have industry specific ones, e-commerce to web 3.0 is a, it's a very popular category of entrepreneurship. You could, you know, you will learn from a lot of experienced entrepreneurs how they have done it, and it's very helpful. Um, there's tons of videos, um, FAQ videos on the site. These roundtables happen every week. Next week is the 275th session. Um, you can go to the free public roundtables page and register. That's where you will find the um, slots to present or to attend. Um, and then we have the premium program where we offer extensive methodology guidance. We work with you shoulder to shoulder on your business week after week. And in some cases, in a lot of cases actually, our members stay with the program for many years. So we have, we are coming up to five years of being in business ourselves. We have many entrepreneurs who have been in the program for three years, four years, and we work with you every week. We work with you every month. We work with you every year. And, and that's a very long commitment to staying with you and helping you through your journey. We don't kick you out of the program as long as you think you're getting value. And, and of course, you know, the point at which you choose to leave the program, if you decide that you have reached a point where you don't need us, of course, the company that was in our program for three years and is now, has now gone on to raise $100 million, 
doesn't need to be in this program anymore. They've reached a certain threshold. They have like 50,000 customers all over the world, etc. That is our, our intent is to get you to a level of sustainability, a level of success so that you don't need us anymore. And we have many companies who have crossed the million dollar threshold and many have crossed at this point, three million, five million, ten million dollar thresholds. And that's wonderful for us to watch. So if you go to the website, you will find some of these case studies. Um, so, so we help you through that, through the program with extensive methodology guidance. We have a great curriculum that is based on video lectures and case studies. We help you with business development, with introductions to customers, channel partners, investors, media analysts, and, um, you know, other mentors, other advisors. We will help you with financing if you are financeable. And that's, again, we will provide you with all the training on so that you can figure out whether you're fundable or not, or what it takes for you to become fundable, what collaterals do you need, et cetera. And then when you have all your ducks lined up, we'll introduce you to investors, help you negotiate, all of that. Um, the Million Dollar Club is what I was talking about in terms of examples of case studies who have been successful in the program. You'll uh, find an ROI analysis of the program on the website as well. Uh, quantifying the one and one and value equation. We only take a thousand dollar annual membership fee as compensation for this program. We don't take any equity. It's the only non-equity uh, accelerator in the world. And the, the issue is without any validation, if you give up, you know, five to 10% equity for small amounts of money, you know, 10, 15, 20K, that's no good. And, um, so we believe if you have to get the kind of value we provide in the out in the you know open market you would have to pay five to ten percent of equity and that's a lot so for very little funding and and that's not our preferred mean means of building companies we build, build we believe in the philosophy bootstrap first raise money later and you can only do that if you can get the incubation and acceleration services without parting with equity. That's the big differentiation as far as the 1M, 1M philosophy versus all other equity-based accelerators. And the failure rates, by the way, of those equity-based accelerators is very high. Y Combinator, 900 companies that they have funded in the last 10 years, 300 have gone out of business already. So it's a 30% it's a failure rate. That's a very, very long odds to play, um, you know, they're very successful. So Y Combinator is an excellent accelerator and everything, but the, the problem is not most companies are not fundable and these accelerators require only companies that, that are fundable for them to be successful because their success metric is the next round of funding and the next round of funding and that's how they stay in business. Whereas our philosophy is you get to customers, you get to revenues, you get to profit. Um, you can take the self-assessment, especially if you're thinking about funding, do take the self-assessment. It's available online for free and see how, where you stand. Um, so lots of information on the website. Go through the website, FAQs, video FAQs, to see if this program is for me. Not, it is not for everybody. This program is not for everybody. It's only for people who can work on their own, self-starter, self-motivated people who can work on online learning, not just in the synchronous roundtable mode, but also in asynchronous learning. You're going to have to digest hours of video lectures and case study based curriculum to learn what you need to learn. There's an incredibly steep learning curve in building a business. We're trying to help you climb that learning curve efficiently, quickly in a compressed timeline, but you have to do your work, your homework. We cannot do that work for you. So if you're willing to do the work, join the program. If you're not willing to do the work, if you're expecting spoon feeding, don't join the program. We don't do spoon feeding. So um, the curriculum is uh, split into core and electives. You get to uh, seven, about seven core topics that are absolutely critical to learn, and then a whole bunch of electives. Um, that will align with the type of business that you're building and the type of issues you're working on. Um, that's pretty much it. That's, uh, if you have questions about the program, we have people on the team. Irina Patterson will ha be happy to answer your questions. I'll introduce you to her. 
Uh, we let you use our social media as well as, you know, media cloud in general to get the word out about what you're doing into the greater world. Um, that's it. If you're trying to build an ecosystem somewhere out there, uh, you know, in any part of the world, could be Timbuktu, could be wherever, you're welcome to become a partner of the 1M1M program. And we have roundtables all through actually most of the fall, definitely September, October, we have uh, lots of roundtables. In November, there are some uh, holidays and stuff. Um, Vision India 2020 is the 13th book from the 1M1M uh, group. And that book has $45 billion ideas focused on emerging markets. You can look at that book and take one of those ideas and develop them if you haven't yet come up with an idea. And then Incubator in a Box is our platform that our partners like VCs, uh, actually mostly corporate and government partners use to run ecosystem development programs. So we have several large tech companies as corporate partners, and we have also started working with some governments You'll see announcements coming out soon. Actually, we have a partnership with the Delaware government that has just gone live, and uh, Ken Anderson is in the room. Uh, you'll see more about this partnership as we go along, where Delaware is using the incubator in a box to incubate their entrepreneur ecosystem. A um, bunch of books recently published, Billion Dollar Unicorns, Carnival in the Cloud, Bootstrapping with a Paycheck, From E-Commerce to Web 3.0, and we can, uh, we're kind of out of time, but if you want to ask questions, we'll take questions from the public chat very quickly. Anybody, questions, comments? Maureen, by the way, has put Tim's uh, entrepreneur journey story, the link for that story on the public chat. So you're very welcome to read that story to get more details of how Tim has achieved the success that he has achieved. He's shared quite a lot today. Um, and, and here's more about that success story and his journey. By the way, folks, Irina Patterson is available at irina at 1mby1m.com, and um, you can contact her if you have questions about the 1M1M program. So before we conclude, uh, Maureen is actually providing a popular question from Quora this week. So, so we answer questions on Quora. And uh, one of the questions that came up on Quora is, is why Combinator asking for too much equity for 120K worth of funding? So I'll just share with you the answer to that question. And my answer is I don't think it's a bad deal. 120K is decent amount of seed funding. 7% is reasonable equity for that amount. Their previous deal I thought sucked. That was 6 to 10% equity for 15K to 20K. This one I think is reasonable. Recently, Sam Altman released some statistics. They've found, funded about 900 companies, of which about seven unicorns have emerged. That's billion-dollar market cap companies. That part of the story is fantastic, I think. Seven unicorns out of 900 companies, that's great. The problem is 300 to 900 went out of business. That's 33%. My analysis is that most companies are not fundable, and if funding is your criteria for success for an accelerator, many companies would fail. That's where the extremely high infant entrepreneur mortality statistic comes from. We prefer working with a different philosophy. Bootstrap first, raise money later. That's what we practice in 1M1M. In my recently published book, Billion Dollar Unicorns, this theme is one of the recurring ones that has yielded success after success. And that's the theme that you heard us discuss extensively today with Tim. Tim is following that same philosophy. He hasn't raised money yet. He raised a little bit of money up front, and then he has bought out that investor. But he hasn't raised gobs of venture capital and is executing steadily. That is more in line with our philosophy. So it depends on who you are. What are you looking for? If it's OK for you to play the kind of odds Y Combinator offers, then their deal is as good as any other equity-based accelerator. Most others do not offer their level of support, network, or branding. But remember, while for Y Combinator this is a portfolio, for you, it's your life. You get to do one company at a time, and if you go out of business, then you write off several precious years of your life. With that background, 33% infant and entrepreneur mortality is not very attractive. You first need to survive, then succeed. So that's my answer to the question that Maureen has put here. 
With this, George is asking, Sramana, does your program help entrepreneurs to bootstrap multiple ideas? Yes. So we often have companies that, or entrepreneurs actually, not even companies who would come in with multiple ideas and dis decide whether, you know, which one is, is the most viable idea and we help them sort through. You can apply the methodology to sort through all that and decide on which idea is the one to really focus on. Does that answer your question? My recommendation is don't try to do multiple ideas in parallel. You can start with multiple ideas, but you need to validate and figure out which one has legs and then throw all your energy into one. It's hard enough to do one business. Doing multiple is really difficult. All right, well, Tim, thank you for being with us today. If you want to add anything uh, to, you know, share with our audience, those who are in the room or those who will be listening in recording, please feel free to do so. Uh, no, I just want to thank you uh, for having me. This has been great. And, uh, you know, the only thing that I would share is that uh, what you said uh, just two minutes ago is so true. Um, you've got to be really picky about your partners. Um, you know, you're going to be putting a whole bunch of your whole life and, uh, and uh, you know, person into this that uh, you want to make sure that, that you partner up with people that have that same drive and that same passion for it so that uh, uh, you don't feel like you're doing more work than the next person and then resentment built and, you know, no good can ever become of that. So, uh, yeah, if you're going to build a great team, you guys all have to have the same uh, passion and, and drive together. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. And this sounds like a right. information on, the, on your site. Terrific, folks. Uh, we will see you back here, Tim. Thank you for coming today. And, folks, all of you, thank you for attending. Uh, we will meet you back here for the 275th Roundtable next Thursday, same place, same time. And meanwhile, I hope you have a very productive week ahead. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for coming.